First uh, Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Um, now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain um, on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six uh, cubits and, uh, and a span, which I think is very tall. I think it's like nine feet tall or something. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head uh, and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels uh, of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to uh, fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, uh, a story that we know um, uh, that we know pretty well. Um, it's probably taught in Sunday schools, probably all around the world, you know. Um, but what was going on in this guy's head at this time, Goliath? What's going on in what's going on inside of him? Um, as he's sort of putting out these threats and, and, and all these sorts of things. Well, this is a guy who is obviously very confident in his own ability. If you're a big, tall, strong guy like him, uh, then um, you, you're going to be. You, you're going to have fought battles uh, before and won them, probably won all of them uh, uh, before. And he was uh, looked up to by. Um, the people, the Philistine people, uh, even the king, no doubt, sort of looked up to this guy and said, oh, here's my go-to, here's my go-to guy when a battle, he's the, uh, he's the one. And um, he trusted in his ability, he trusted in his uh, weapons, he trusted in his armour. You get the impression that uh, he wasn't really afraid of anyone or anything. A um, little bit, you know, arrogant, perhaps a bit cocky, um, you know, knew he was big and strong and tough and wanted everybody else to know it um, and probably knew that pretty much everybody was afraid of him and, uh, and that they didn't really want to engage with this person uh, because, you know, they thought, well, if we engage with him, he's, he's going to win. I'm, I'm no match for somebody like that. And so right up to this point, everything about the life of Goliath would have told him that he was uh, going to be victorious. Um, there was never any doubt in his mind. He didn't, he hadn't tasted failure beforehand. And so he just thought, well, we're just going to put this out there and, and uh, we're going to win without giving it too much thought, I'm sure. Um, having Israel as their servants uh, because of him, no doubt would have given him even more, uh, perhaps honor and prestige and standing in the, in the Philistine world there. Um, and so he gets to this point that I'm gonna fight somebody and we're gonna win, I'm gonna win. And look at all these slaves and servants that we're going to, uh, that we're going to be able to put to work sort of thing. But 
what he hadn't taken into account, um, one major flaw in his thinking is that he thought that he was going to be fighting somebody from the army of Israel or some Israelite. That's what he thought he was going to be doing. But uh, what he was really doing is he was taking on the living God. And he didn't realize that. He didn't think of that. He didn't sort of have that in his calculations uh, at all. But despite the fact that he's a, a seasoned warrior, nothing really prepared him for this kind of battle. He'd probably never fought anyone before where he had been at a disadvantage. Um, he was always the he was always the preeminent one. Um, but he'd never he'd never encountered a situation like this where he really was at a disadvantage and didn't um, know it. He thought he was challenging um, Israel. He thought he was defying the armies of Israel, but really he was challenging God and he was challenging God's authority and and, and defying the Lord really uh, without really knowing. Um, all of those all of those things you know the word about the word for defying when he said i defy the armies of the living god it's um uh korof is the hebrew word and um it means it means a lot of things but one of the things is to expose to expose something by by stripping something away it'd almost be like um you know you're going to a house and there's wallpaper on the wall and you sort of strip off the wallpaper to reveal what's to reveal what's actually there that's what this word is sort of sort of getting at to 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 expose a, a truth to to expose something and and no doubt when he's challenging them that's what he's doing he's really exposing israel um their fear their um lack of belief um, their lack of trust is exposing all of those things you know I mean they've got you know they've got shields and and weaponry and armor and you know they've, they've got stuff but he was exposing a fear that they had uh, not only because this guy was big but they they'd lost they'd lost that trust you know um, uh, it's pretty certain that he would have known about the God of Israel. It wasn't as if it was sort of a secret in the lands around about there. Um, maybe he was almost mocking them in a way. Maybe he was saying, well, you're supposed to be this, you know, this army that uh, has a God that does all these things for you. And look where you are. I, I come out and you're, you're cowering in a corner sort of thing. You know, maybe he was kind of mocking them and, and scolding them almost. Um, for their uh, for their unbelief there now if you go to verse 22 so all of this is happening and and um you know nobody's nobody's making any sort of a move as far as the israelites are concerned in verse 22 it says david left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren and as he talked with them behold there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spoke according uh, to the same words. And David heard them. So he hadn't heard this before. He was off tending sheep and, and doing all that shepherding sort of thing. And um, the army and his brothers were sort of there and they'd heard it perhaps several times. Um, but David heard it for the first time, the words out of this guy's mouth. In verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. So nothing sort of changed as far as um, they're concerned. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's, father's house free um, uh, free in Israel. Oh, look, you're going to get, you're going to get some good stuff. If you, if, if you end up being the person that's going to, you know, kill this, this Philistine, if, if someone's able to do it, 
well, you're set up for life. Maybe they're trying to goad them into it almost through, almost through uh, like a greed type of thing. Wow, if I, if I try this and I do it, I'm, I'm going to be set up for life sort of thing. Verse 26, and David spoke to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living uh, of the living God? And so David heard the words of Goliath, and he he realized what the issue was. He he realized that hey, these people are looking at this from a natural point of view. You can sort of you can sort of hear the cogs sort of ticking over. Um, the thing that he didn't have that everybody else seemed to have was was fear, and he had replaced uh, that with um, with trust in the Lord, not in himself, but in in trust. Um, we know that the word Israel means ruling with God or princes with God, you know, um, and yet he saw the reproach that they weren't living up to that name by any means, um, almost that shame had come upon them. And, and he was the only one that seemed to rec uh, recognize it. How can, he, how can he reconcile the fact that their name meant ruling with God with this army that he sees? He's not part of the army, he's still a, uh, a young, young man sort of thing. And he sees all of this um, around him. Uh, this unbelief is surrounded by this by this unbelief. If you go to verse thirty two, he talks about you know is there not a cause and all these sorts of things. In verse thirty two, David said to Saul, who was the king, "Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistines." And Saul said to David, "You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth." And he, a man of war, uh, um, from his from his youth, unbelief will always try and talk you out of serving the Lord and trusting the Lord. Sometimes that unbelief can come from an external source. Someone's going to tell you, "No, that's impossible, or that can't be done, or whatever." Other times, it can even come out of your own out of your own brain, you know, um, and and you can almost talk yourself out of. Uh, the blessing um, sometimes. And so here's the king who should be the you know, leading from the front. And he's saying, no, 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 you can't do it. You, you're too young. You're too weak. I mean, I mean you know, you, you, you're you five foot four and 17 and this guy's nine feet tall and swords and spears and all this sort of stuff. You don't even, don't even think about it um, kind of thing. Um, in verse 34, and David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied uh, the armies. Of the, of the living God. And so he remembers um, prior victories, prior testimonies, if you like, have, have built, him, built him up and given him a confidence. He's seen, he's seen firsthand uh, the Lord working in uh, seemingly impossible situations. And I've got a lion attacking me, you know, or I've got a big bear attacking me um, in the natural. Uh, or the lion and the bear are going to be more than enough to to finish anyone off, and yet, and yet the Lord was with him, and delivered him out of all of those um, uh, circumstances. In verse thirty seven, and David said, "Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine." And Saul said to David, "Go, and the Lord, uh, and and the Lord be with me, uh, be with you." Um, you might have a giant problem. Um, and he had a giant problem. He had a nine foot tall problem. Um, but the thing we've got to remember is that we've got a, a giant solution. 
we're going to, the solution to anything we have is always bigger than the size of the problem. Um, if we will avail ourselves um, uh, avail ourselves of it, you know. Um, verse 38, and, and Saul armed David with his armour, and he put a helmet of brass on his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword, uh, sword upon his armour, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them um, uh, put them off him. And so he got rid of the encumbrances of the world that were trying to be thrust upon, uh, thrust upon him and said, I, I don't trust this stuff. I haven't used it before. I haven't seen it working before. Um, it's never done anything for me before. Why am I going to trust in, in all of this stuff? And so he puts it off of him so that he can just rely on a simple solution. He knew he was the head and not the tail. He knew that he was above and not beneath. And it's all he needed to know. Didn't need all that other stuff. Um, the great thing about David is that he had no use for a plan B. They often talk about that in New Guinea when you go there. Uh, there's no plan B, you know. You can't run off to the doctor, you know. It's more likely to be a, you know, a, a witch doctor or something. It, it's, it's likely to be no hospital near you. You know, maybe there's one in Port Moresby or the big city or something. But for most of the people, there's no access to it. There's no plan B. It's, I've got to trust in this or, you know, there's no, there's no, good, uh, no good outcome. Um, uh, so verse um, 40 he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? that thou comest to me with staves or with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David um, uh, by, his, by his gods. You can see in this that Goliath is looking down and going, what on earth is going on here? I wanted something that was, you know, at least going to take five minutes for me to win, not five seconds as, as what he thought was going to happen here. You, you, you're throwing little sticks at me. What, what is going on here? This is not even, this is not even fair by, by Goliath's standards. Um, 44, and the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou, uh, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take your head from you. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, um, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Um, and so he sort of puts it back on him, doesn't he? And says, well, you think you're going to do this. Well, uh, you've got all this weaponry. But I'm coming in something far greater, uh, Goliath, than you will ever know, than you will ever understand, than you've ever experienced, uh, ever experienced um, before. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. That's what Jehoshaphat said when the armies came against him. You know, well, that's what he was told by the prophet. The, the battle is not yours. The battle is the battle is God's. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no 
no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheath, and slew him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And, um, you know, what he didn't know was that, what Goliath didn't know, was that he was absolutely no match for a youth armed only with trust in God. He had, he had no answer to that. Um, yes, he had five stones. Five, of course, is the number in numeric for grace. The grace of God was with him. But he only needed one, uh, God himself, to do, uh, to do the job. David threw the stone, but God guided the stone. And it ended up exactly where it had to be, right in the middle of his, um, right in the middle of his head there. In the world, this story is often used to describe the underdog taking on the champion. The underdog taking on, on the champion. Um, many people sort of read it in that, in that way. And they're 100% correct, except they get it wrong. The underdog was Goliath. That's who the underdog was. He didn't know that. He'd never been the underdog in his life. He was the favourite to win every fight he'd ever been in by, by a, a big margin. Um, he's a, a, a giant guy, threatening, um, wanting the people of Israel to be afraid, and they were, um, wanting them to lack faith, and they, and, and they did, you know, they did lack faith. Um, wanting, to, wanting them to sort of run and hide, you know, and they did. It says that they fled, you know. Um, it's interesting that um, there was this enemy there and David didn't get too close where his weapons perhaps could have um, hurt him. He, he had this huge problem and what he did was is he tackled it early and he, he engaged early on. He didn't sort of run up to Philist to uh, Goliath and uh, engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He just said, Lord, you just take care of this. He had the stone, yes, but it only took one of the five and the Lord guided it. Um, he tackled it early and from a distance. And perhaps that's something that we can learn from that, um, you know, we don't always have to get down and dirty with the problem. We can, we can tackle it early. If you've got issues of any kind, Carlton was sort of alluding to this today, that, that we do it, we do it early and we, uh, we pray early. We trust early. Um, we don't, you don't let things sort of get on top of you. And that's what he did from, from a distance. He tackled the problem and, and, uh, and won, you know, the Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know, we, um, we don't have that, that, that sort of fellowship there with them sort of thing. Um, where should we go? Let's um, skip a bit. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. I was going to read 2 Corinthians, but we'll, we'll skip that. I don't have time for that. Second, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And verse uh, 1, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, <clears throat> says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you uh, should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith with them uh, that heard it. David could have had the greatest weapon in the history of the in, in the history of mankind, but but without faith mixed in with it, um, nothing was going to work against a problem like um, against a problem like Goliath. In fact, David had the faith to unyoke himself from the world, from the armor, from from the weaponry 
of this world so that he could defeat an enemy that seemed undefeatable. And uh, many times people have things that seem undefeatable um, uh, in life. Um, that verse about um, Saul saying that, you know, you are a youth and he is a, a man of war from his youth. Not only was he saying you're too weak to tackle the problem, he was actually saying this is an experienced problem. This is somebody that's, you know, it's not just that you're a young, a young guy and there's no way you can do it, but look at the size of the problem. For starters, you're sort of coming at it from two, two uh, angles, you know. The world will often tell us it's too hard. You're not up to it. Um, whatever it might be. Um, this is too hard for you. This is too difficult for you. But we know, of course, that that's, that's not true. As long as we're exercising that faith. Faith is an exercising um, thing. It's, a, it's, an action, uh, it's an action thing. In verse 12, it says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of, um, of the heart. It's interesting, the Amplified puts that. It says, The word of God, uh, for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power. It makes it active operative, energizing, and effective. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line between the soul and the spirit. The dividing line between the soul and the spirit. And of joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, it exposes and sifts and analyzes and judges the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. And so God knows every single thing about you what you're thinking right now, what you're contending with, and what, what you will contend with in the future. And, of course, he's got the answer to all of those things. The word that we read is alive, and uh, it, won't, it won't change. In verse 16, because of all of this, he says, let us therefore come boldly, as David did. He came with purpose. He came with expectation unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in, uh, in time of need there. There's no variableness with the Lord. We read there's no shadow of turning. What he declared yesterday, you can trust in today and tomorrow and for the eternities uh, to come. Be bold as David uh, was bold there. Um, We'll finish Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And verse 16, I think we're going to. Uh, yep. Uh, I'm in the wrong book. Ephesians chapter 3. And verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. How was David strengthened? How was it possible that of all the army people there who would have been fit, strong, trained, all of that stuff, and yet a kid comes up that knew a lot about looking after sheep. And that, maybe there wasn't much else. But he knew about the God of Israel. He knew that he was a ruler with God. He knew that he could put his trust um, uh, in him. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. It's the power that works in us. It's not the power that is us. 
because that's where Israel was failing. They were looking for the power within themselves, just of themselves, and maybe what they could put their hands to, their weaponry and whatever might have been there. It's not the power that is us. It's the power that works in us. In Romans 8, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so it's never about us. Um, it's always about him. Him increasing and us decreasing. The world might think sometimes that it has you beaten. Maybe even sometimes we can think that the world has us beaten if it beats hard and if it beats hard enough. Um, Goliath thought the outcome was a foregone conclusion. He really did. There was not even a battle really in his mind. He's just thinking, how long will it take me to win? <laughs> uh, and when he saw David, he must have thought, boy, oh boy, what are they throwing at me here? Well, he said it. Sticks, they're throwing sticks at me. Goliath thought the outcome was a foregone conclusion. And he was 100% right. He just had the wrong winner. <laughs> that was his problem. He thought uh, the outcome was a foregone conclusion. I'm going to win. But the Lord had other ideas. And he used somebody that had faith to throw a stone and then and then and then guided it you know the world might think it has you beaten sometimes maybe but together you and god will always be a majority will always be on the winning team what were the chances of david losing to goliath zero there was no chance that David was going to lose to Goliath. Now, if he had gone up and said, well, I think I'm pretty good with a spear and, a, 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 and, a, and I'm pretty good at throwing stones and I'm, I've got my shield and uh, come on, Goliath, let's go for it. Well, he would have been toast, wouldn't he? Um, but he didn't. He just went out, picked the stones. Lord, you do it. I'm, I'm just your, your vessel, your servant. And so... David and God had a 100% chance of winning, as do we. You and God, a 100% chance of winning every single time because he's on our side, as he was on their side. They were ruling with God. We are spiritual Israel, ruling with God. It's what we do, all the people said. Amen. Amen.